Grace, mercy, and peace from God our Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ. Some of our children's most bitter cries are not the result of physical pain. Yes, they frequently sob when hungry or uncomfortable, especially as they are younger and unable to give voice to what they need. But many of their tears are born of frustration. I'm sure we've all seen a child become exasperated trying to do this or that, and then suddenly dissolve into tears sobs, weeping. Not only children, adults can likewise be overcome by frustration. When was the last time you tried over and over to get something right, but just couldn't make it happen? No matter how much you struggled or <coughs> poured your heart and soul into it, you couldn't meet the challenge. You did not succeed. Once you fail, you became frustrated. And we, like children, when completely exasperated, throw a tantrum. Hopefully no one sees us when we act that way. Paul speaks about one of his great frustrations in today's epistle lesson. This famous passage describes Paul's experiences as he tried to live up to God's standards. To achieve the holiness prescribed by the Lord's holy law. Here, once again, these verses. I don't understand my own actions. For I, I do not want, for what I do not want to do, that I do. I do the very thing I hate. I know that nothing good dwells within me, that is, within my flesh. For I have the desire to do what is right not the ability to carry it out. For I do not do the good I want, but the evil I do not want, that is what I keep on doing. I think we can all appreciate Paul's sense of frustration and defeat. Those who take seriously the Lord's call to holiness can sympathize with that climactic cry of exasperation, indeed despair. Wretched man that I am, who will deliver me from this body of death? This cry of frustration invites us to consider ourselves as well. Questions such as this one. Of all the things that cause trouble in our lives, where do we rank our inability to live up to God's standards, to our moral failures? On the one hand, we can put it out of our mind, simply ignore God's laws, at least the hard ones, and give in to our carnal desires. On the other hand, we know that that's not the right way, and so we strive for perfection in our Christian walk, we walk and only end up frustrated. You all know how much perfectionism can lead to frustration, don't you? That perfectionistic approach, rarely if ever, helps us reach our goal. In fact, it usually gets in the way of us achieving our heart's deepest desires. With such thoughts in mind, I would ask you to consider your Christian walk this morning. Is there some pet sin or besetting evil that you simply cannot overcome? Is there some particular moral failing that regularly bedevils you? Well, within the Christian tradition, there is a list of the so-called seven mortal sins. It's a pretty good place to start, right? These temptations are wrath, avarice or greed, sloth, pride, lust, envy, gluttony. Who amongst us has never struggled with those things? I think it's safe to say that those vexations trouble all of us, at least to some extent or another. This list doesn't even include things like bitterness and those grudges that we hold. Brothers and sisters, in a fallen world, there is no short of temptations and occasions for stumbling. Today's epistle lesson reminds us that the problem is not that we lack the desire to do good. No, the problem is deeper than that. 
The problem is that we are not up to overcoming the power, the power of sin. We have just read it repeatedly and stated it with our own voices this morning. You know how our confessional liturgy goes. We are sinful, unclean by nature. We have inherited sin, and so we routinely disobey and thought, word, and deed, both by what we do and what we fail to do. We haven't loved our neighbor with our whole heart, nor have we put God in the first place. But the psalmist said, no one is righteous before you. We have just confessed. And so conclude that we deserve present. Strive as we might, brothers and sisters, we will not prevail. Our experience confirmed this many times over. Left to ourselves, we cannot overcome those occasions for stumbling, indeed, doing great evil. The end of every spiritual struggle against those deadly sins and even smaller ones is frustration and defeat. So here are the good news. God the Father does not wish you to suffer and fail under the burden of your sin. That is why he has revealed his gracious will to you through his Son, Jesus Christ. In today's Gospel lesson, Jesus declared these words, I thank you, Father, Lord of heaven and earth, that you have hidden these things from the wise and understanding and revealed them to little children. Yes, Father, such was your gracious will. The gracious will of the Father that Jesus came to reveal is that God loves you. He means to forgive you. As we know, Jesus not only revealed the Father's will, but he also brought it into fulfillment through his ministry, his suffering and death. Today's Old Testament lesson should, should sound familiar. It's that famous Old Testament prophecy that we read on Palm Sunday. Zechariah's pro prophecy describes the Messiah coming humbly, seated upon a donkey, riding a beast of burden. As you know, Jesus faithfully fulfilled this prophetic promise by entering humbly into Jerusalem. That was Palm Sunday. And just a few days later, Jesus willingly gave himself into death for you. He took the full weight of all of our failures on himself laid them on the cross. There his voluntary sacrifice removed all guilt and all transgressions forever. Because of Jesus' substitutionary death and resurrection, there is divine rest for our souls. Rather than obsess over our failures, our inability to overcome sin, today we are invited to receive the Lord's gracious gift, forgiveness, grace, Eternal life. Some of you know the words with which Jesus offered these things by heart. Come to me, all ye that are ye that are he that are labored and heavy burdened. I will give you rest. Our Lutheran forefathers spoke of Jesus' gracious offer of forgiveness this way: Christ calls all sinners to Himself and promises them rest. He is eager that all people should come to him and receive his help. He offers them himself in his word, and he wants them to hear it, and not plug their ears nor despise the gifts of the gospel. Furthermore, he promises the power of the working of the Holy Spirit and divine aid for perseverance and eternal salvation, so that we may remain steadfast in this faith, finally gain eternal salvation. Today, the resurrected Jesus once again offers you peace, the rest that comes through the promises of the gospel. Here again, I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your soul. My yoke is easy, and my burden is light. When Christ calls you to himself, the Spirit brings you. 
the Lord delivers forgiveness and rest for your soul. Moreover, he promises that in the end he will usher you into eternal rest, and you will dwell with him in his presence forever. This promised rest leads us to thank and praise our gracious Lord, just as Paul wants to. On the one hand, we understand Paul, Paul's cry of despair, wretched man that I am, who will deliver me from this body of sin? At the same time, we also have the same hope of the gospel. We have taken to heart what he experienced. Thanks be to God the Lord Jesus Christ. This one, who, this one who began a good work in you will bring it to completion in the day of our Lord Jesus.